Welcome, welcome back to our second night of revival. I'm going to ask you to stand together with me. We're going to sing the song as we worship the Lord together this evening. Behold our God. Let's worship the Lord together. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has given counsel to the Lord? question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold how God seated on his throne Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has felt the nails upon his hands? Bearing all the guilt of sinful man, God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold, our God, cleaned on His throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King. Come, let us compare. Come, let us adore him. Amen. Thank you for that great singing, preacher. Man, brother, you got a maze up here. How are you going to preach up here? You're going to move something, right? Amen. Uh, it's good to see everybody tonight. We're going to open up our service uh, with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Dave Bishop, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I want to go over just a couple of things. Uh, we're going to take up our offering here in a moment, but uh, we are thankful that you are here. Uh, obviously, you remember that we are in revival, uh, but be praying for tonight. Be praying for Tuesday and Wednesday as well, the other preachers that are coming. Uh, brother, uh, I talked to Brother Jonathan today. He was, he was around, uh, and um, uh, they had a baseball game over at Bethel, but be praying for Brother Jonathan and Brother David, who will be here uh, Wednesday. Uh, we had we had the the older preacher Sunday, the younger preachers middle of the week, and 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 you're representing my age right now, brother. So you got to do a really good job tonight, okay? Do what? I know, I know, I know. Just amen. That's why I like him. He that's good. Amen. Uh, but we're excited about tonight. They're going to sing some songs for us in a little bit. But uh, uh, I'm going to invite our ushers to make their way to the front. We'll take up our uh, Wednesday offering. 
Uh, and so as they make their way up here, uh, remember everything we take up is going to go to our uh, our uh, different uh, evangelists for the week, and so we're excited about them, excited what the Lord is already doing in our hearts and lives. Uh, and so uh, with that being said, I, I'll have uh, Brother Emmett, if you would please pray over the offering. So we don't get out of here at midnight. Uh, that's it for our preliminary. So at this time, we'll have uh, uh, Brother Kevin and Dawson's Road come on up. Um, please make, make them feel welcome. They're going to sing some songs, like I said, and then he's going to preach for us. So it's yours, brother.
the word belong is easy, so I won't tell you who it is or who you can find on the internet about them. Um, two of us are preachers, and one is a deacon. Oh, that's a lady. Yeah. Don't know who she is, don't know where it is to tell you, but she is the queen of deacons. So we define all lines. But I love these fellows that sit there and soak up and warm their face and so many
How many of you know the preacher likes a Ford? Amen. There we go. Is that on? All right, good. Are you really glad to be here? There you go. We do have um, our recording project out there. It's the only one we've done, and everything we sang tonight is out there. If you'd like to take us home with you, we'd love to go home with you. We'd love to ride in your car, be in your stereo, go to work with you. We have a CD, MP3, and uh, we have some of these preachers. You bring yours with you? It's, it's not any good in your office. Uh, I take, we sell these signs at our table. They're not made in China, and they're only $5. And they become a big hit wherever we go because this originated, I was preaching revival somewhere, and I was in a church, and let me tell you something, it was as cold as a December evening. It was so quiet. It was just, I'll just be honest with you, it was dead. And I was preaching, and I was plowing deep, and I was shucking the corn, as they say. And I got to a point in my message when I thought everybody should have said amen. But they didn't. So I pulled out a piece of my notes from my sermon, and I scribbled on the back really big, amen. And the next time I got to preaching, Brother Nick, I stopped, and I held it up, and they called on. And somebody went and made me a real professional sign that sits under my pulpit. And my people get quiet, preacher. I hold it up. How many of you know, you've been preaching long enough to know, when you go certain places, sometimes you have to bring your own with you. And ladies, these work really well, let me tell you. It's a joy to be here. Thank you, pastor. Do you love your pastor tonight? You didn't even need that. I'm proud of you, all right? I appreciate his ministry and Tabernacle Church. And uh, we're literally neighbors just up the road from you guys. And I'm thankful for what the Lord is doing here in this church. I want you to take your Bible tonight and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And as I tell my folks, keep it open. I want you to see what the Lord hath said. This is probably my favorite miracle in the Bible. I absolutely love this passage. And anytime I get a chance to go somewhere I have not been before, I have to share this passage because it has meant so much to me through the years. John chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 1. Now you've been sitting and listening and encouraging us as we were singing, I want you to stand if you're physically able. And we're going to look at these verses together. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. You follow along with me. And after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? This he said to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Now look at verse 12. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. 
Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together as your church tonight. I thank you for this local church, Tabernacle. And I pray, Lord, for the pastor, his dear wife and family. I pray for the leaders of this church and every person who makes it such a great place. I pray your hand would be upon this ministry. And tonight, Lord, in my heart, in everyone's heart, would you help us to be reminded that without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, we desperately need you tonight. So speak to our hearts in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Tonight I want to challenge you with this thought. As a child of God, you never have to go hungry. As Christians, there will be times in our lives when we are faced with the stark realization that we desperately need the Lord. It is during the darkest and most trying of times that we learn what faith really is all about. Trusting, depending on the Lord. It is during those dark and troublesome valleys of life that our faith is truly revealed. When we no longer have the strength, the resources, the wisdom in and of ourselves to fix things. As strong, educated, talented, and even determined as we might be, we learn through the trials of life firsthand that Jesus was exactly right when he said in John 15, 5, Without me ye can do nothing. I wrote this in the flyleaf of my Bible years ago when I was a student at Southeastern College. A preacher came and preached. I don't remember who he was, but I remember this statement. The greatest ability is our dependability on God. And that's true. That's exactly what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples here in the story before us. Now, if you know your Bible, if you're a student of it, you will understand that the miracle that is often called the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that each gospel writer records. Now, pastor, that in and of itself tells me there's a lot to learn from this magnificent miracle. And you, my friend, are quite familiar with the story. The Bible says there were 5,000 men. Now that's not counting women and children. 5,000 men with women and children, undoubtedly, who had gathered to hear Jesus teach. They were literally in awe waiting for him to perform a great miracle. Thousands of them gathered together to see the master do something spiritually miraculous. But there was a problem. They were hungry physically. They needed something to eat. They must have been free will Baptists. Amen. Hey, we're free meal Baptists. Amen. We always like fellowship, covered dishes. Well, the resources were meager. There was a lad there who had a lunch. Five loaves of bread, two small fish. And Jesus took those meager resources. He blessed it. He multiplied it. And the disciples distributed it to everyone that was there. And every single person got a belly full that evening. They were filled. And the Bible tells us that they were filled so much that the disciples went around and collected the fragments. In the south, we call them the leftovers. They got all the leftovers together, put them in 12 baskets because God had blessed exceedingly abundantly above all that they had asked or 
thought of. Now I thought about that. That's a sermon in and of itself. How many of you would say with the preacher tonight, God has blessed me far beyond what I need and what I deserve? I'm like David, my cup runneth over. God has blessed this preacher. And by the way, if God has blessed you tremendously, and I'm convinced he has, shouldn't we take the baskets of leftover, so to speak, and bless somebody else? Oh, you can be a blessing to someone. I've been blessed. You've been blessed. I got to thinking about that this afternoon. I've been saved. I like that word. I've been saved. I've been forgiven. I've been adopted into the family of God. Hey, you're looking at a child of the king tonight. I'm somebody because of Jesus. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not all that I should be. But I'm one of his. And he is mine. Oh, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Oh, I'm a part of his church, his bride, his body. I've got his word that feeds me. I can talk to him in prayer. Hey, I've got clothes on my back, shoes on my feet, a warm place to lie down. I've got a beautiful, loving wife at home, two beautiful girls. I'm a blessed man. And did I mention I pastor the greatest church? Amen. God's been good to me. Now I want you to think about something. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he did the miraculous. What is a miracle? Something only God can do. Hey, if you and I can do it, it's not miraculous. It might be awesome. It might be impressive. But when God does something that he alone can do, it is a miracle. And the greatest miracle that's ever happened in your life is the day you got saved when the Lord changed you forever. 5,000 and above people didn't have to go hungry that day because Jesus was there. And I want to challenge you just for a few moments. If you know the Master, if you're following the Master, there's never a day in your life that you have to go hungry for what you need if you'll trust Him. You say, preacher, what do we see here? We see the Master doing what only He can do. I want to point out three things to you this evening. Number one, when we look at verse 5 and 6, life has its share of tests. Would you agree with me tonight that life can be quite difficult? How many know what it means to walk through the valley of life? The troublesome, dark times. We are, as I preach Sunday morning to my folks, we are a needy people. Life has its share of tests. Look at verse 5 and 6 again in your Bible. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, that is Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. I want you to notice that before Jesus fed the multitude, he looked at one of his disciples, Philip, and he said, Philip, there's a lot of people here, and I'm paraphrasing. Thousands of people. They've come to hear me. They've come to see the mighty works of God. But there's a problem, Philip. These people are hungry. And he looks at Philip, and he puts Philip to the test. He says, Philip, what are we going to do? Philip, what do you propose is the answer for the test before us. I got to thinking about that. Every single day of our lives, we are faced with tests. We are faced with evaluations, if you will, of our faith. The Bible says that Jesus said this to him to prove Philip. In other words, he wanted to determine Philip's faith.
faith. But here's what I want you to understand. Jesus already knew Philip's faith. The point Jesus was trying to make was, Philip, I want you to see your level of faith if you're going to trust me for the miracle. Well, I'm quite convicted of Philip's situation and what he did. And every day of our lives, and sometimes they are enormous tests, we're faced with the challenges of our faith as well. Anybody ever been here before? How about when the money runs short, but the bills keep on coming? How about when a job falls through, when sickness or disease sets in, when these old bodies won't do what they need to do anymore? The preacher has mentioned several people in your church sick and battling. That's a constant in every ministry because we grow older and our bodies begin to break down, don't they? You might be facing a test of your faith when it comes to your physical stamina tonight. Oh, when disease sets in. How about when a marriage is falling apart? When a child is wayward and rebellious and living in sin? Hey, when you're facing loneliness and depression or you're battling some besetting sin that the devil's using to have a hold upon you. It's a test. It could be any number of things. But here's the question, what do we do when the test comes before us? Do we trust the Lord or do we do what Philip and later Andrew did? Which brings me to my second point. Life is filled with tests. But number two, you're going to fail the test every time if you only trust in yourself. You hear me? You're going to fail every time if you only trust in yourself. That's what verse 7 through verse 12 teaches us. Because Philip responds to Jesus in a faithless, fleshly, non-spiritual way. Jesus looks at Philip and says, Philip, what are we going to do? And this is instinctively what Philip did. Hmm. He started calculating how much money they could muster up and how much food they could buy. And he looks at Jesus and he says, well, well Lord, 200 penny worth is not a, enough to, to give every person just a little bit. You know what Philip was doing? He was doing what we do too many times. He was trying to solve the problem. He was depending on himself instead of depending on the master. Oh, and listen to me. Faithlessness, not trusting the Lord, is contagious because Andrew was there and he heard Philip's response. Andrew says, well, well, Lord, there, there is a lad here, and he's got, a, he's got a little lunch with him. He's got five loaves and, and two small fish. And listen to his faithlessness. But what are they among so many? What mattered was that the master was there. Was this not the same Lord and Master who had called them? Was this not the same Jesus that they had seen work so many miracles before? This is the same Jesus that gave sight to the blind, caused the dumb to speak, the deaf to hear. Hey, this is the same Jesus that went walking on the water during the storm and said, Peace be still. And everything subsided. This is the same Lord who went to the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. This was the same Lord that could raise the dead. Here was the bread of life, the living water, the Son 
of the living God right before them. And Philip was trying to figure it out on his own. And Andrew was doing the same thing. They were without faith. And how many times do we do the same thing? I don't have to pastor this church to know it has problems. What do you mean, preacher? Every family in here is facing problems and trials and dark moments. If you're not, let me come join this church. But there's something peculiar about you and different. But I guarantee you I'm right, pastor. And you know these people and you love them and you've been here long enough to know where they sit and you families are going through you know the trials that they're going through and so many times let me tell you something I've been there and I still find myself quite often facing these kind of tests when your backs against the wall you don't know what you're going to do you don't have the answers your strength is gone and it gets discouraging and Jesus all along saying, fellas, I'm right here. Why don't you just look to me? They were a hard-headed bunch, just like we are, preacher. Because later on, after Jesus had performed this miracle, he took seven loaves and some meager resources and fed the 4,000 plus and they were faithless then. So many times in our lives, the Lord comes through when we need Him the most, when we're desperate for Him, when there's nothing else you can do but say, God, I need you. But when the next trial comes, what are we? Absent-minded. Lord, you did it before. Why don't I trust you now? The tests of life are going to come. You will fail every time if you only trust yourself. But let me tell you something thirdly. Jesus will always take care of you because he's the master. Helen Lemuel wrote a great song many years ago. I'm not against new music. I like a lot of new music, certain kinds of new music, Christian godly music. But let me tell you what a lot of the old songwriters had in their songs that a lot of new songs don't have. Some good, solid doctrine of who God is and what he can do. And let me tell you something. Helen the Mule wrote a great song that the church has been singing for centuries. She said, Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what Jesus wanted Philip and Andrew to do quit looking at the size of the multitude quit looking at your meager amount of money and lunch and look to me I'm more than able and willing to help you and folks that's what you have to do tonight whatever you're facing whatever mountain is staring you in the eyes don't look at God through the mountain look at God above the mountain 
let him meet your need. Jesus will always take care of you. Now, watch this, and I'm almost done. I'm going to prove it to you. Watch. There we go. I see something that encourages me here. When those two disciples didn't know what to do, Jesus took over. And I'm thankful when I have made a colossal mess of things in my life and I've tried everything and everyone except Him, He comes through and helps me. Jesus says He doesn't scold them. He says, make the people sit down. And he took over where they couldn't provide. He says, bring the lunch to me. And he does something that we all ought to do. He gave thanks to the Father for it. Every time we put a morsel in our mouth, we ought to be thankful that God gave it to us. And any time God blesses us, we ought to give Him thanks. The Lord was thanking the Father as an example to all of us, and especially those disciples and onlookers, that every good and perfect gift, as James tells us, comes down from above. And He blessed the bread, He blessed the fish. Must have been hush puppies and flounder, because that's what we would like. And He broke it. And John, I don't know what it looked like, but I hope we can perhaps get a picture of it when we get to heaven. He just broke it, and it kept multiplying. I mean, the bread just kept coming. The fish just kept coming. And everybody, thousands of people, were eating, and they were happy, and they're about to hear the Master teach. They were filled. You know why? Because Jesus took over when they needed him the most. And I'm here to tell you tonight, as I close this message, I guarantee you, in all of these young people and adults alike, from the youngest to the oldest, there's something you're battling. There's some kind of test that is before you that is trying your faith. And Jesus is saying patiently and tenderly, turn your eyes. You know what you need to do tonight and what I need to do? And I've learned more and more I need to do it. You need to bring your need. You need to bring that test to an altar, a place of prayer, and say, Jesus, take over and forgive me for not trusting you all along. And I'm here to tell you, I'm living proof. He can put the pieces back together. He can do for you what no one else can do. He can do the miraculous. You don't have to go hungry tonight if there's a need in your life. But you have to give it to Jesus. Now I want you to bow your heads with me. And I want you to be honest tonight. What is it you need God to do? It's the most important part of our service because I pray God's been speaking to your heart and I pray He's telling you right now, trust me. I used to tell our kids in junior church when I preached to them years and years ago, if it's a big deal to you, it's a big deal to God. Whatever you're dealing with tonight, whatever you need, why don't you just come ask Jesus to help you? You say, preacher, that sounds so simple. Simple but powerful. He will help you. Before we start the music and sing and close this service, is there somebody here tonight would say, Preacher, I'm going through that right now. And the Lord knows what it is.
And I wonder tonight, preacher, if you'd pray for me. I don't even know your name. But I can remember your face. You say, preacher, right now I'm going to slip my hand up. There's something I need the Lord to do. And I want to trust Him. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up tonight? Let me pray for you. God bless you. Be honest. We're needy people. Let's all stand to our feet. Tonight this altar's open. I'm pretty confident that this is a church that wants you to use it. My brother's going to lead us in a song. Why don't you come tonight? Bring your need, your family's need, your church need. Why don't you come bring it to the master tonight? Father, bless as only you can. Let's sing that little song together. Are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. What is it you need tonight? What are you hungry for? Just look to him. Oh, you know that little chorus singing. Turn.